is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video. Now, as you'll have seen on the internet over the last day or so, the brand new Intel 12th gen chips have landed and they've provided some pretty incredible performance figures. For this build then, I'll be putting together a system based around their i5, but with DDR4 memory. There's been a lot of fuss around the latest flashy DDR5 standard, but could DDR4 and the associated motherboards be a great value way of getting 12th gen performance without 12th gen prices. In this video I'll be running you through all the components as well as the CPU and stuff that I selected and why, showing you guys how to put the system together from start through to finish before booting it up to see just how well it performs in a wide range of titles. We're talking more than 15 of the latest AAA titles and most popular games out there. Let's dive into the video though after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. Corsair's M65 RGB Ultra Wireless builds upon the legendary M65 design with the latest Corsair Slipstream Wireless tech and much more. With a 26,000 DPI Corsair Marksman sensor that can be adjusted in DPI steps as small as one, this mouse means business. Adjustable weight allows you to find your perfect center of gravity, while Omron optical switches deliver hyper-fast and precise responses. Everything you love about the M65 in 2021, now wireless. Check it out at the links in the description below. It only seems right to kick this build off by looking at the CPUs. Now Intel are very kind and they sent us this lovely little press kit. This is basically so that we can take a look and evaluate the chips before the main launch to really see if they're worth your cash or not. Got a nice box here that says built for the next generation of gaming. I sure hope so after what, let's face it, was a bit of a disaster with 11th gen. We've got this kind of older lake graphic wafery style plaque. That's quite nice. This obviously gives you like a breakdown of what a CPU looks like under a microscope. So that's quite cool. Uh, we've also got this Intel kind of acrylic logo thing. Ah, I see. So it's actually a stand for our older lake sort of wafer. Nice, love that. Under here, hopefully, we should have some CPUs. We do. So Intel have sent over the i9 and the i5. For today's build, we're going to be focusing on the i5. Though if you'd like to see some coverage of the i9, that can be found over on the channel. We've got a wide range of builds, a full review video, loads of stuff coming out around Intel 12th gen. Now, Intel 12th gen is a massive generational leap for Intel. It also supports the latest DDR5 memory. This chip does, though, support DDR4. Four, something we'll be leveraging in this build. As a word of warning, DDR5 DIMMs don't fit into DDR4 boards and vice versa. Unlike DDR3, the notches are in a completely different place, so do watch out for this. We found in our performance testing that DDR5 does give you a performance upside, but given just how good 12th gen is, we perhaps don't need all of that upside for today's build. As I mentioned with the CPU, we do need to pick up a DDR4 specific motherboard, as a DDR5 board just isn't going to work. This is the Asus Prime Z690 D4. D4 indicates it supports DDR4. This is one of Asus's more budget-oriented Z690 boards, and we'll be doing a big Z690 motherboards buyer's guide very shortly, so make sure to get subscribed for that one if you aren't already. Feature-wise though, this board is still relatively strong. You still get support for the latest 12th gen processors with a decent bit of overclocking. You still get four RAM DIMM slots for dual channel performance. You still get Gen 4 M.2 PCIe support, as well as all of these PCI lanes for expandability. It does feel a little bit bare bones when compared to something like Asus's own Maximus Hero board, but for us, it will do the job. Importantly as well, you still get USB-C on the rear panel, as well as a singular USB 3.1 Gen 2 port, which has 10 gigabits per second of bandwidth. No Thunderbolt, no two and a half or 10 gig ethernet. It is basic, but you do pay a lot less for it. To install our CPU, the process is actually a little bit different to what we've been used to with the last gen and all the gens before it really of Intel chips that I can remember. Go ahead and locate the triangle on the bottom corner of your processor, it's on the bottom left as usual, and then lift up the arm on your CPU socket. Unlike older generations, this doesn't unfold from the bottom, it actually unfolds from the top of the processor. As you can see here, it unlatches like so. We then want to go ahead and the same as usual, just drop that processor in, it is slightly bigger as well than the older chips, so that's an interesting observation. Before popping the socket back down, the black cover will pop off as usual, apply a bit of pressure but not too much, 
and then secure the arm in. That is our CPU nicely installed. I'm going to be pairing the CPU up with 32 gigabytes of RAM from Corsair. This is their Vengeance RGB RT. I've mainly gone for it because of the high clock speeds you're able to pick up. This kit is 3600 megahertz, so you will get more performance with 4000 megahertz on Intel. Installing RAM is pretty much the same as what you used to. For us, we're going to be using the gray RAM DIMM slots. So pull back the clips on the left-hand side, line up your notches, and with the Corsair logo facing outwards, away from the board, apply a little bit of pressure and your DIMM will install. Repeat for as many DIMMs as you've got and that's pretty much it. I'm going to come back to the CPU cooler in a moment, but first let's install the storage because this is nice and easy. This is the WD Black SN850. It's one of the best Gen 4 drives if you're more budget oriented. In fact, it actually costs less than some Gen 3 NVMe drives on the market. You still get around seven gigabytes of read speeds and around 5.3 gigabytes per second of write speeds. So the writes aren't quite as quick, but the reads are certainly very snappy. This is the non-heatsink version of the drive as well, which means it's slightly cheaper and we can use the built-in Gen 4 PCI heatsink on our motherboard to keep the SSD cool. Go ahead and remove the heatsink, and for this step, you will need to throw away your big, massive Phillips head, and you'll need to pick up something like this, a teeny, tiny little screwdriver to make sure you don't thread those all-important screws. Go ahead and remove your M.2 heatsink cover, Peel back the protective film on the actual heat pad itself, the thermal pad. Slide your M.2 drive into place, pop it in at sort of a 45 degree angle before pushing it back down. Fasten it into place with the included screw and then whack your heatsink back on and the storage is all nicely complete. It's now finally time then to pop our cooler in. Now this is the Deepcool AK620. As much as these Intel chips are pretty efficient, it's still important to give them good cooling, especially if you want to overclock them. You could go the liquid cooled route, but I've gone for this instead. It's a bit of a monster, and I think it also works well with our black and silver overall theme for today's system. I really, really like some of the stuff that Deepcool have been doing recently. They have been pulling it out of the bag as far as great quality, affordable components go. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that this build is somehow super budget. It's not. It's got a 3070, which are nearly impossible to buy, and it's got a new Intel i5, which is hardly cheap either. But it gives you great performance for that mainstream gamer, a segment of the market that hopefully will start to return as stock somewhat comes back to normal. Now you can see this CPU cooler is just a monster. I think what we are going to go ahead and do is just unclip at least this fan here. That will make not only installing the cooler a lot easier, it will make installing the motherboard much easier as well. In fact, I think we actually need to remove both of our fans. This is because this one will get in the way for actually screwing it in. So let's just lift that one out as well. Keep those safe for the minute. And that, I mean, that looks amazing. You've got lots and lots of heat pipes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's really, really great for heat transfer. You've got this nice deep cool black design at the top and a good looking silver heat sink. So all around, pretty good. Hopefully as well, we shouldn't have any RAM clearance issues. No, we don't. This low profile memory is gonna save the day big time and allows us to just pop the fan on over the RAM a little bit later, like so. And now something to be aware of with these new Intel chips is that they don't use a backwards compatible mounting hardware solution. That was a lot of words. And what I mean by that is you need to go ahead and pick up some adapters or a new backplate that specifically supports the new Intel socket. I know that Corsair and Deepcool and others will be giving away free adapters and will start shipping coolers very soon, if not now, with the latest LGA1700 support. But check before you buy and I'll pop latest pricing and availability at the affiliate links down in the description below. Step one, take this included backplate for our 1700 support, flip your motherboard over and just slot it through the rear a little something like this. Pop the board back down onto the box and you should now see four silver posts poking through each corner of your motherboard. You then want to take this bag, which includes a load of female to male and a load of stoppers, pop the female to males on top of these four posts, and then pop these on top of them, fastening them down with the thumb screws that we got in that female to male screw bag. Once that's done, we can go ahead and actually screw the cooler on. Don't forget your thermal paste, which comes included in the box. You don't need too much, but the chip is a bit larger than last gen, so a little bit more than a grain of rice. Screw your cooler in and you're good to go. We can pop the central fan back on, but leave the other fan on the end off for now, as that will make screwing the motherboard in to the case a lot easier. The next stage of proceedings then is to move our now completed motherboard assembly with RAM, 
cooling, and of course our SSD into the case choice. Now this is a lovely chassis from Deepcool, it's got plenty of RGB, some really nice fans included, and overall a great design. It isn't mesh at the front, but it does have some really nice magnetic dust filters, USB 3 on the front panel, and all in all a really nice design at a price point that doesn't break the bank. There's a few things you want to do with the case in order to actually go ahead and install the motherboard assembly. The first of those is to remove all of the side panels, so we've got the tempered glass side panel, the rear steel side panel, and usually we'd remove the front panel, but but because we've got no water cooling, oh, that was close. But because we've got no water cooling, we don't need to. Instead, what we want to go ahead and do is locate each of the standoffs in the case itself. These standoffs are important because these are what we're going to go ahead and screw the motherboard into. We need to make sure the standoffs in the case match up with the motherboard. So go ahead, grab your board and locate each of the holes. So for us, we've only got two at the top, two across the middle and two along the bottom. That means for this system, we need these two standoffs here, these two standoffs here, and then a further two at the bottom. So these two just need moving down to the bottom of the case. You can do this with a pair of pliers or a special tool that comes included uh, in the case. It really is up to you, but once you've done that, we can go ahead and install the motherboard. To do this, we just want to go ahead and grab our metal IO shield. This is gonna clip into the rear of the case. Be careful, these can be quite sharp. On higher end boards, they do come pre-installed. And then you can go ahead, grab in the board, buy our hefty CPU cooler. That's a really good test as to whether it's installed properly or not. If it isn't, then you're gonna find out. Before sliding the board into place, tucking it around those cables and lining up the standoffs. There we have it. So uh, one of the standoffs is actually slightly raised, which will hold the board into place, at least for now, allowing us to screw it down. Once we've done that, we've only got a couple of components left and then we can finally boot the system up. Remember as well, of course, to pop the fan as well back on uh, now that it's installed into the motherboard and all screwed in. Next up on our agenda then is the graphics card. Now I've got to admit, before we got these CPUs in, I did start planning the builds and I went, you know what, let's pair an i5 up with like a Strix 3060. And then I saw the performance of this 12600K and realized that would be frankly a bit of a waste. The 3070 is a much better pairing and our 12600K excels in Cinebench as far as single and multi-threaded results go, CPU Z, Ida64. You can find our full review with all of our benchmarks and comparison both on the website in the card section now and in the full review video we've made, which I'll also link down below. This Tough 3070 card continues our Asus theme today. I think it matches slightly better than something like a Strix card would, but also looks a bit nicer and performs better than something like their dual card. Obviously the current state of the GPU market means that basically whatever card you can find at a price you're comfortable with is what you should probably buy. And unfortunately, it's not really a buyer's market right now to be super picky about exactly the skew of GPU that you want to go and pick up. Asus makes some great cards though and the Tough is up there in my opinion. Value for money on it is fantastic as far as how close it gets to MSRP while still giving you a three fan cooler, some extra power delivery and some nice factory boost clock speeds. We're going to be installing it into this top slot on our motherboard and to do this you will need to remove the two rear PCIe covers. In one of those, here's what I prepared earlier moments, I've gone ahead and taken those out already. So it's a simple case of clicking the GPU in. There we go. So that's now in. I think that looks actually really, really fantastic. I'm a big fan of a chunky air cooler. I think it can actually set a build off so nicely and people underestimate these compared to liquid ones. We do just need to go ahead and actually screw the GPU in. So just use these two screw holes here alongside these sort of hexagonal headed screws themselves to fasten the card in. And then all we need to do is install the power supply, the very last component on our list today. This will give everything power in our system and make sure we're good to go. When it comes to the 3070, you want a 750 watt unit or above. If you don't follow these recommendations, you may find yourself having a few problems as far as wattage is concerned. This unit from Deep Cool is fully modular, it's 80 plus gold, it's super efficient, and if that wasn't enough, it's got a 10 year warranty. Pretty impressive stuff from Deep Cool. As I say, they are killing it at the moment. This video won't be a full cables and wiring guide, hence the time lapse. Sorry guys, but if you'd like to see one of those, I'll link that in the card section now. With that being done though, it's about time we go ahead and boot the system up to see just how well it performs and jump into some more detailed i5 12600K benchmarks. But first, we need to see how good it looks in an epic glam montage in the only way we know how. I'll see you in a second, but first, roll that montage. just 
how awesome this system looks when it's all powered up, I think you guys know what's coming next. It's the performance and benchmark section of today's video. As usual, we're going to kick things off by looking at an overall summary of all the results that we were able to gather. We usually test around about 15 of the latest and most popular games to give you guys a really even, consistent picture of the frame rates to expect if you built this system for yourself. Of course, this build is a bit different using an i5 with DDR4 and not DDR5 memory, though we already discussed earlier the minimal performance impact uh, in the current climate that that actually has. The first of the focus titles today though that we'll be jumping into game by game is GTA 5. Here we got 133 frames per second on average tested in the in-game benchmarking mode. All the settings for all the games will precede the gameplay that you see and we tested pretty much across the board uh, for this video at 1440p. It was a similarly positive story in Watch Dogs Legion where we managed to achieve 98 frames per second tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. We love games with benchmark modes not just because it makes our life easier, but because it also gives you guys some really repeatable results that you could mimic at home with the same title on your current system and see how it stacks up. Sadly, the next title today on the list, Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War, the multiplayer zombies mode specifically, doesn't have a benchmark mode, but the results were still great. 119 frames per second on average to be precise. All of our frame rate testing is done using both MSI Afterburner's Reaver Tuner and Nvidia FrameView to make sure we get some really accurate results. Those accurate results are important in the next title, Apex Legends, a game very much uh, that revolves around high frame rates to give you the competitive edge. 164 frames per second on average was a mightily good result, with 90 and 99th percentile results that showed strong uh, frame rate that didn't really fluctuate all that much. If frame rate's something you're after though, the next game is the one for you. I sound like a broken record, but it is of course Valorant. Here we managed to achieve 315 frames per second on average in a game that visually, as you'd expect, uh, looked great. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege next up then, we're testing loads of games out today. This title uh, once again provided some great results and had an inbuilt benchmarking mode. Woohoo! 210 frames per second on average to be precise, with 90 and 99th percentile results in the region of 194 and 183. But what about a bit of Cyberpunk, the most difficult game to run arguably on the market right now? Unless of course the new COD and Forza games, which we'll be looking at in next week's videos, uh, are somehow very difficult to run too. Nevertheless, we got 81 frames per second on average with 77 and 69 for the 90 and the 99th percentile results. Moving on then next up to Fortnite. This is a title where we tested out at 1080p competitive settings, breaking our general rule of thumb of testing at 1440p. Nevertheless, we got 282 frames per second. That is bonkers. The game looked great, uh, visually stunning, and really, really competitive for you esports-oriented players out there. Finally then, the last game we tested out today was Call of Duty's Warzone. We'll no doubt get replaced by the new COD this week, but until then, uh, this is a good test, giving us 127 frames per second. As I say though, keep your eyes peeled. Next week, we've got three new games entering the benchmark roster to keep things nice and spicy. With that though, that pretty much wraps it up for today's video. If you enjoyed it, get subscribed to see more from us, drop a like rating, heck, even a comment. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.